Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming back from a very short break. We have a couple of online speakers today, so it's very important that we kick off on time. I'm Christine Wells. And this is Yuki Nara from Osaka University. And we're going to split chairing, so Yuki, take it away. Yeah. Okay. okay, guys, so let's start the session. So the first speaker in this session is Yutaka Suzuki. He's a famous professor for single cell guys at the University of Tokyo. Okay, uh, Yutaka, please go ahead oh, and talk. Thank you very much. I ha we have to be very quick to save the time for the Sarah Tahiman's <laughs> keynote speech. And I misunderstand, the, misunderstand that my, my presentation time would be uh, trend, uh, 20 minutes rather than uh, 10 minutes, so I have to be very quick. So my background is I'm, I'm in charge of the sequencing collaboratory at the University of Tokyo. And we are, you know, uh, are operating these uh, setups. And perhaps in this framework, uh, my central mission is to uh, tell you that this uh, platform is open for the Asian you know, Human Cell Atlas Asian committee, uh, community. If you don't have an access to this next-gen sequencing lab, uh, please contact me at the suzuki at hcc.jp. So, and uh, also I have to skip. Uh, actually, uh, I want to present our you know, potential contribution in terms of the data production for the uh, healthy individuals. And without being, being aware, of the, aware of the same thing is going on as a framework under the framework of, work of AIDA. Uh, we are doing the same thing at, you know, at a very much uh, smaller scale. So my question started uh, when the COVID, first COVID started three years ago, and uh, uh, how diverse our immune uh, landscapes are, especially among healthy individuals. Actually, and uh, actually, the, the first motivation was uh, when we saw um, uh, uh, at the first year of the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic, and we found in some cases the B cell maturation is somewhat severely delayed, and the antibody was not induced almost at all. Uh, causing that uh, prolonged hospitalize, hospitalization of the patients. And our uh, question was whether that's, th there are several people originally having the potentially having that that's a personality or by chance or during the course of the infection, something wrong may happen to that patient. And in theory, uh, we are born with the genome and causing, uh, you know, defining the inherent uh, basis for our, you know, the you know, body. And uh, uh, thereafter, after the birth and the growth and the regeneration, aging, and eventually death, and the genome information is somewhat modified uh, by the uh, you know, variable interaction with the environments and perhaps sometimes with the medical records, which should be different depending on the different backgrounds and uh, cultural and the food habits. And that part should be uh, memorized as a, as a form of epigenome and transcriptome. So, and uh, there are millions of genome information uh, compiled up in the database, but our knowledge about the, transcript, the transcriptome and epigenome diversity among healthy individuals is still limited. That's my understanding. And we started the single cell analysis, making a catalog for the healthy individuals. And uh, actually, the first, uh, we started the initial bunch of the analysis uh, for the technical uh, validations. And for that purpose, we started the analysis with uh, 10 healthy individuals. And instead of the small number of the samples, we intensively uh, analyzed uh, for the single cell for the, those uh, blood samples. And, uh, First part is already out in the paper, so please refer to uh, this paper uh, so that you can get an access to the data set as well. So, and uh, this is the initial data set. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the kind of uh, reproducibility and the robustness of the data correction. And for that, uh, we uh, take blood samples every three days for over months, and sometimes we compare the results with fresh frozen or fresh uh, samples or frozen samples, and to see the difference uh, between the, you know, in terms of the reproducibility. And uh, as far as our places, our lab is concerned, the, you know, the difference is unexpectedly small. And this is the same individuals and, and uh, samples are collected uh, in a month over you know, every three days. And these are the differences. And uh, when we go, went to the aggregated bulk, the pseudo bulk, and the uh, correlation was almost one. So, and uh, this is the same uh, story for the H2, the uh, different individual uh, showing that the differences, okay, the, you know, the data, data is uh, sufficiently accurate to be analyzed to, uh, you know, analyze the difference between the different individuals. 
So, and we further uh, carefully analyzed the data reproducibility by also considering the side tough. In the side tough, it has its own advantage because it's much cheaper uh, platform. Uh, when we uh, just analyze the cellular components of the single cell, it's much uh, easier platform. And in here, we also uh, confirmed that uh, correlation was good and more than 0 0.85 in terms of the Pearson's correlation and found, you know, uh, assure, assured that the data that question is, uh, seems to be good. So, and when we looked, at, so we wanted to analyze how the you know single cell profiles are different uh, with uh, between firstly between different individuals, and in a sense, uh, we can compare the profiles between H and H2. Uh, even though we are not sure these differences are due to the daily changes of the immune cell profiles or the inherent difference between the individuals, at least we can compare this uh, H1 and H2 healthy individuals almost at the same age, uh, uh, like in a statistically statistic, statistic manner. And we found that H1 is having a rather uh, rich uh, immune profile for naive B cell or other uh, B cell centered. Uh, immunity, rather, uh, while the H2 is more biased, uh, kind of uh, biased to uh, T cell uh, responses. So the immune cell landscapes are originally inherently different uh, depending on the individuals, even though they are both human beings. So they, you know, we are not comparing the extreme uh, disease cases, and not. so the difference may be small, but beyond the, you know, within the reach of the current detection of the single cell analysis. And we uh, conducted several analyses, and our place is the university, so accepting lots of foreign students. So we intentionally included Thai students, Indonesia students, and uh, students from developing countries uh, where, where the uh, uh, infectious diseases are more uh, severe. And uh, let me show you some extreme example here, and which is healthy uh, donor number seven. Uh, he is a, a male, 70 years old, uh, having experienced a survivor of the acute myeloid lymphoma, having received the immune, no, 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 the, the uh, therapy, anti-cancer drug therapy, uh, our CHOP, rituximab uh, and CHOP and a severe one. So it's reported that, okay, uh, we found that NK cell population is very much expanded uh, with, this, uh, with this particular individual. And we looked at the single cell gene expression patterns and found that uh, granzymes and uh, perforins, effective enzymes for the uh, responses of the NK cells are uh, at least uh, at a similar level with the other individuals or sometimes enhanced than the, than the you know. And other individuals showing that the NK cell centered inflammation or the, you know, the activities are uh, more enhanced in this individual. So then the vaccination. Uh, we wanted to see how the immune landscapes may provide a base for the immune responses. And in a sense, the vaccination was the precious chance because everybody is, has received the same uh, stimulation, you know, even though uh, they are different. You know, so it's, a, it's a rare chance. And we conducted a similar overtime analysis, and we took blood samples minus, uh, minus the day of minus one, plus one, plus three, and plus seven, and plus 28 for several times, and compared the uh, cellular component changes in the cellular components, and, and also confirmed, which it was also confirmed by the site of in terms of cellular population. And uh, most for, from the most of the people, usual, usual uh, people, and the immune cell profiles are changes of the immune cell profiles are as expected, uh, like this way, uh, like the uh, monocyte firstly induced, and this, uh, you know, the the button was passed to the CD4, and then the CD8 and the B cell response uh, followed, and like this way. So the, it's 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 like this way, but in some extreme case, like H7. Uh, where, when, uh, in which the NK cell was at least expanded. Strangely, that uh, vaccination reaction did not take place almost at all. And accordingly, and the uh, uh, antibody was very lessly induced in this individual. And we are not sure what the, exactly the molecular li uh, base for this, uh, you know, the aberrant, uh, kind of aberrant, unexpected uh, antibody induction. But we wanted to see how many of the people are having the same immune profiles before and prior to their vaccination. 
So uh, the first paper is already out. Please refer to the, that paper for more details of the technology, uh, technology things. And uh, somewhat encouraged, encouraged, encouraged or kind of satisfied with the initial results. And we are currently scaling this analysis to a uh, uh, larger number of people, especially focusing on elderly people. And there, yeah, okay, so they're yeah, starting from the single cell uh, GX attack multiome analysis and the genome sequencing and site of analysis. Also, the old link analysis of the uh, massive, um, uh, the mass aspect analysis of the protein of the blood. So, uh, currently, our data sets consist of the one, more than 100 individuals covering the total of 250 single cell libraries. And, uh, okay, I was not aware of the AIDA activity, so I'm trying to, I'm having a discussion on how we can, uh, our activity should be connected to the uh, framework of the AIDA. So, and in this case, we are uh, also collecting the data from the, the usual live data. And uh, uh, that's, uh, pro by providing a smartwatch for each individual, and we are collecting the data from the foods and sleep and exercise and the medical checkups. And there is an APRI and uh, where in which the photo, the food photo can be trans, uh, translated into the nutrition and other things, and the calories and other things. And so that we can collect the data for all together, together with the single cell uh, molecular information. I think that spot is no less, far, no less at all in, uh, important than the molecular you know, information. Or uh, when we go into the interpretation of the, uh, the collected data set. So the data shows up like this way. This is the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Okay, so the immune profiles uh, when we are at the level of the cytoph uh, are really diverse. And for example, this is the average figure of the immune cell, uh, the cell uh, blood cell profiles uh, for uh, among the 40s, healthy 40s. And uh, when uh, they come to the age of 80s, so so much changes are, are took place, like the you know the like uh, naive T cell population decreased instead of the NK and other infl pro inflammatory uh, cellular components uh, increased. So and uh, this is the statistics, and I have to uh, omit. So we again looked at the uh, extreme uh, patient, patient not the individuals uh, having the very expanded NK T cell uh, NK cell population. And uh, looked at how the you know the uh, uh, we firstly uh, confirmed that these uh, cell are cell are and the cells are, are functional in terms of the cytokine production and uh, you know the other epi epigenomic landscape features because we are having have having collected uh, ATAC uh, information as well, so uh, showing that uh, really uh, the normal or enhanced activities. And, uh, and we also looked at O-Link to monitor the status of the proteum, uh, serum proteum, and found actually that uh, okay, immune profiles can be also monitored by the O-Link. And uh, this uh, NKT expanded person uh, really are in uh, the state of the flow inflammatory response, yeah, the status of the blood cell. So uh, time is all lit up. So this is the NK cell, so very, very uh, skewed uh, uh, cell profile. And, uh, and this time, uh, somewhat unexpectedly, the vaccination reaction, the response of the vaccination was really normal. So, and uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big difference between the previous person. And we also looked for another person uh, where the NK T cell are skewed, uh, like the expanded. And we also, found that the ex, uh, immune cell profiles and uh, cyt uh, cytoplasmic, uh, pl protein profiles are so much different uh, uh, from, uh, for, uh, with each other from those two, three uh, individuals, but the uh, immune responses are, uh, the vaccine responses also are found for these individuals. But there are other individuals where the vaccination was not always successful. Uh, we're uh, comparing the immune cell profiles and the attack uh, profiles and uh, protein profiles all together, uh, considering why those responses are varied uh, depending on the people. So, and to conclude, uh, I, we are starting the single cell data production uh, to explain the diverse immune reactions between even among healthy individuals. And uh, for the data further analysis, uh, actually the international collaboration is definitely needed. So please contact me to, uh, for the data sharing to this address, ysuzuki at hzc.jp. And this is acknowledgments. And uh, lastly, I want to, uh, I like to thank to all the uh, residents who are joining joining this single cell monitoring. I'll stop my talk here and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Itaka. I'm sorry for the time. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any one quick question? Okay, maybe we have many time for discussion later. So let's go to the next speaker. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Itaka. Okay, let's move on to the uh, next speaker. Next speaker from Rios Sugimura. I think he's joining by web. Yes, I am on the web. Yes. Oh, thank you, Rio. Maybe, yeah, Rio is yeah. from Moscow University. Now he's working at the University of Hong Kong as the uh, associate professor. So, uh, Rio, please go ahead your talk. And also, thank you for joining this meeting. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting. So, uh, can you see side? All right, perfect. Yes. So, I am Rio from HKU, and today I'm going to talk about human embryonic development using organal system. Lots of single cell RNA seq, and also with the spatial transatomics. So, I'd like to share some progress of our recent work in stem cells modeling human embryo. And uh, trying to catch up with a recent, like, our new attempt to implement molecular backholding. Basically done by two PhD candidates in my lab, Imi Chow and David Shem. Imi has been a very talented informatician. David did all the wet experiments of 10x chromium and 10x vision. So the question we had is, can we use like stem cells as a platform to model human embryo, like human baby thing? Uh, we have been using human IPSCs, ESCs for long. And we did uh, some modification with a collaboration between a Pentao laboratory in HKU. We use uh, defined chemicals to expand that potential of IPS cells. Now, uh, endowed uh, capacity to make prophoblast and hypoblast, not only epiblast. So using that kind of stem cells as a start point, we made an organal system, basically using a commercial medium as a consistency assurance. And we have the time course of 10x chromium and 10x vision. So this is how exactly uh, our organ looks like. Then the data basically, I mean, this is from 10x chromium, three data points, and you can see an uh, emergence of uh, like Trophoblast, lipoblast, right, yolk sac equivalent, eventually enriching like neuroectum, cardiac mesoderm, and then hematopoiesis. Because the kit is more like originally containing hematopoietic cytokines at the start of stage. Then that basically we assure like hemo, which we call a human embryonic organoid. Hemo follows the time course of human embryonic development. And then we do 10x vision, ask like more structure detail. And this is basically our original data. We have done a uh, RCTD. Um, this is our uh, section and all the noise. And I was not convinced by this resolution because it's so low. So this is how particular our data looks like. Uh, one organoid like containing many, many, many cells. And if you see like this circle thing, green circle, RCTD, like uh, original annotation of 10x, we call it one cell, but actually contains more than 50 cells. Then we did a collaboration with HKUST nearby university in Hong Kong, Department of Mathematics, and they use an uh, imaging based analysis to the convolute heterogeneity. So here is a case we have a uh, H section, we can see nucleus and assign each nucleus as one cell. Uh, we paired with 10x chromium, single cell analytic data set, and did uh, some training data from public data. And actually, yeah, it has been done by a lot of work by Kan Yang in the uh, Department of Mathematics and Angela Wu. So they are also having uh, another publication, probably by archive soon, about the detail of this program. But this is our end product. I mean, like, uh, not exactly a single cell delivery yet but it's kind of satisfactory. It's better than original, like our CTD thing. So now we can see more cells per spot, and then we try to figure out what's a composition of those organoids. So let's say uh, this section, like uh, 10 organoids per section. And out of 10, we can see eight, uh, having a very heterogeneous, like multi capacity. 
Only like two are like these guys, uh, number eight and number two are predominantly tr uh, trophoblast. But others are more containing hematopoiety, trophoblast, and hypoblast, more like epiblast components were there. And we are kind of consistently generating a multi-lineage, our organoid. Then I actually a hematologist as a training. Then the interest always is, can we make blood? Or can you see how blood develops? Yes, yolk sac. Yolk sac is having a typical feature, like blood island. You can see like Lord CD71 Ethelbrass standing a cluster of red things here. And this is where like erythrocyte and then metachiocytes, like source of blood red begins. I'm so happy to see like, this structure in our hemo and then ask like those 10 nets vision data. Can you see the same thing? Yes. So now we define like those uh, particular region where lots of metatiocyte and erythroblast are making some cluster, which we call yolk sac erythro metatiopoietic niche. And then we did a uh, more dissection in molecular level and we saw uh, speci especially uh, lots of expression of Integrins. Integrins has been well known for hematopoietic regulator. Like when people start using iPS cells, you see the iPS cells on integrin and then differentiate into hematopoiesis, I mean progenitors and metachiocytes. So kind of, yeah, makes sense. And then also we saw uh, the like vitronectin partner of integrin expressed by yolk sac endoderm. So it's like a combination of integrin and vitronectin based interacting and potentially facilitating metatiopoiesis. They ask where this is the case in human embryo. Of course, there are many papers already came out, you know, uh, human fetal samples, and yes, we did a data mining. So that's uh, one particular stage of yolk sac hematopoiesis, and we reanalyzed and identified one like a Pearson correlation similarity between our yolk sac portion and also yeah, those real human yolk sac express vitronectin and integrin, especially uh, integrin type 2B, uh, ITGA 2B. So these are consistent between like a real human embryo and in our yolk sac niche. This is already published, I mean, not published yet, but it's already by our type. So you can see all the raw data and the more detailed story here. Essentially, our story is we model human embryonic development from PSCs and then combine both 10x chromium and vision and trying to get a single cell level stage to a 10x vision machine. And today I more talk about metachiot site integrity with connecting thing. But also, yeah, in this paper, we defined weak signaling as a potential regulator of neural crest maturation. And source is perhaps a trophoblast. And that's kind of an interesting new thing. Then switching gear, uh, this is totally new. Even not yet by archive, an uh, ongoing study. It's very hot in my laboratory. So again, I said I am a hematologist. So always my question is, can you define, can you mimic? the logic in embryos. We know like hematopoiesis begins from hemogenic endothelial cells, like this tiny population in our 10 next chromium. Um, but always I wonder when I see this the kind of data, uh, this green cells is really source of this bunch majority of blood or not, we don't know. Unless we do a barcoding. We have been trying like uh, CRISPR-Cas9 barcoding as parallel approach, but it's still uh, technically uh, challenging in some case. So we kind of now go ahead on to mitochondrial variants. I think it's now being very much consensus by uh, last work by Vijay Sankaran and Peter Van Galen. And then, you know, mitochondrial limitations much faster than somatic mutation, and you will be able to use this as an uh, innate barcode. Then, you know, always, you know, see people can say, hey, but this protocol is only 20 days. Probably. Yes, I do agree. But the thing is, when people culture IPS cells, that's basically a clamp passage, bulk culture for nearly years. 
like the cells we are using are basically 10 years old. So it's very likely high chance of mitochondrial variants accumulating and diverse. So it's like uh, already barcodes are there and it's very much repertoire. So we adapted Peter Fangaren with collaboration and then tried the master on both NX chromium and vision. So idea is, can you see a mitochondrial enrichment by single cell and seek and spatial plastomics? Uh, yes, the protocol is very reproducible. Uh, we are collaborating with informaticians and EPIs in our institute, Yuan Fa Huang and Joshua Fo, very amazing. And uh, we adapted M cohort and video SNP for our computation pipeline. I mean, this is more like the universe. I'm more like a biology person, but I do appreciate this collaboration. But we got towards like nearly 36 variants. And we are now more dissecting. Example, like we found three variants uh, on multiple lineage and potentially useful to reconstruct a phylogenic tree of those hematopoietic lineage. We further applying this 10 next vision data Try to see a topological deformation because if a cell is differentiated, making some clonal population, like a bacteria colony, they will be spreading into this area. And can we see like those clonal zone of certain lineage? And if you have like a, those consistent barcodes, we will be able to do that. So that's trying right now. Thanks. So I think uh, we are time, time up. So I'd like to appreciate Amy, David, Amazing, PhD candidates, also Shifi and Handy for uh, another work. They were doing amazing jobs. And collaborators, Joshua, Iwanfa, Pentao, Angela, Pan Yang, and many others. Thanks so much. And I am recruiting. All right. Thank you, Rio. Great, grateful. We have a, a time to have one or two questions. So uh, if you have a question, please go on to the microphone and Okay, I have one quick question. So your mitochondrial variation, are you going to detect the somatic mutation by using hologame sequencing or just uh, detecting mitochondrial variation story on the tax data? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Actually, yeah, originally we were more focusing on mitochondrial variants, mm -hmm. but actually that's also e means idea. Maybe we can take a somatic mutation and try to see a correlation. And I do agree. So we are working on this one right now. Thanks. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. All right. I have a quick question. Uh, sorry I'm, if I missed it, but um, you demonstrate that you can do three lineages to understand hematopoietics, but how, what is the advantage or disadvantage compared to saying a single lineage understanding of hematopoiesis from IPS, as opposed to the model that you propose there, you have three germ layer differentiation, which maybe mm -hmm. more complex, and you're actually losing out on the number mm -hmm. of cells that you're looking for. So what's the advantage of looking at multiple lineages? Okay, so uh, in advantage compared to two dimension, I mean, I have been originally working on two dimension for a number of years. And I in the best meant, uh, three, three dimension, lineages, sorry. I meant three yeah. germ layer uh, differentiation. Exactly, models. yeah, I know, I know, yeah. yeah. If you try to just make hematopoiesis, you know, you kind of straight onto a particular lineage like endothelial cells and hemogenic cells. But we will be always missing certain support by niche, like placenta supports HPC expansion, and yolk sac, now you know, as I show here, like integrity in vitro nectin to support metacarocytes. In the way when I was doing like a single lineage induction by like defined thing, like omitting trophoblast, hypoblast, what we were seeing was like uh, making metacarocytes were not easy, like when we, I tried before. But no, I mean, metacarocytes is in our system is one of the major product. Okay, great, thanks. thanks. Okay, thank you. So maybe mm -hmm. we are now on time. So uh, Rio, uh, next was the next speaker. So Rio, thank you so much for your great talk and hope to see you in person next time. Okay, uh, let's move on to this next speaker, uh, Dr. Waving Liu. Uh, he's a vice president special assistant to the chairman of BZI groups. So he's involved in population games initiative and special temporal mix. So we are really happy to have him on this symposium. Go ahead, please. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. Uh, 
So the paper I'm presenting today is something that uh, was recently published in Science uh, and is featured on the cover of that particular issue. Um, and it's and we and through this paper, I would like to showcase the exciting uh, new technology that we developed um, to achieve this work, and as well as also uh, give food for thought on potential applications to, for human regenerative medicine. So uh, sal salamanders, so so mammals have um, very limited regenerative capacity. Uh, or, or I just say almost none, in terms of um, brain regeneration. Uh, but salamanders have um, retained this um, capacity even in adulthood. So in order to unravel the mechanisms by which salamanders uh, uh, regenerate um, and heal an injured brain, uh, we studied the axolotl and we applied um, our technology, spatial enhanced resolution omic sequencing, um, or abbreviated stereoseq, to the axolotl brain. Uh, so we, the, we, we, we were able to achieve um, single cell, so, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So we, we st stereoseq is, is able to achieve um, whole, uh, whole transcriptome, a spatially resolved whole transcriptome um, analysis at single cell or subcellular resolution. So we uh, we applied this, uh, and the resolution goes is as small as uh, 500 nanometers. So we applied this uh, to the salamander uh, to, to the axolotl brain, and we were able to do image-based cell segmentation. To um, it, we were able to analyze about two or three hundred thousand single cells um, with this technology. And we were able to get down to, um, we, get, we were able to achieve 850 spots um, per cell on average, corresponding to 6,300 UMIs per cell, um, as well as uh, uh, about 1,700 genes per cell. So first we applied stereoseq to the axolotl brain and um, to the adult brain. And in this slice, by, by, by doing spatially constrained clustering, we were able to identify um, six major um, anatomical subregions within the axolotl brain. Um, and corresponding to uh, doing, doing, spatial, doing further clustering, we were able to identify 16 different major cell types. Uh, and we were able to see their spatial distribution across um, the, the axolotl brain um, at single cell resolution. And so here you could, you're able to see the excitatory neurons um, in the uh, mainly focus, mainly in the medial um, medial pallium and, and dorsal pallium and lateral pallium, but, and you're also able to see the inhibitory neurons um, uh, uh, concentrated mostly in the striatum and the septum. Um, and we further validated um, the the ability to recapitulate the spatial location um, by uh, comparing with uh, in situ hybridization data. And uh, more interestingly. Uh, we, we, we focused on different populations of the endo, uh, epidymal uh, glial cells, which, are, which correspond to the neural stem cells in mammals. Um, so these are the cells that have been demonstrated by previous research to, to be potentially, to, 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 to be responsible for the uh, regeneration and for neurogenesis. Um, and so for the adult um, um, axolotl, we're able to identify three different distinct um, EGC populations um, uh, dispersed across various regions in the ventricular zone. So next, we wanted to investigate uh, how uh, um, the, 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 uh, the cell dynamics of the axolotl telencephalon during development. So we took six different time points, three um, in the larval stage for stage 44, 54, and 57. We also looked at the juvenile, adult, and um, metamorphosis stages. And we were able to identify 33 different um, cell types. Uh, and, 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 we're, and more interestingly, we, we, we could see the um, um, the location, the, how, how those cell types change over these different time points. So, in the uh, in the early stages, in the larval stages, the we have a population of developmental uh, ependymal glial cells, um, EGCs, which are uh, which disappear by the juvenile stage and are replaced by the three different um, um, EGC cell types that we 
uh, demonstrated earlier in the adult slice. And then also we see that neuroblasts and immature neurons occur um, simultaneously almost around, this, around those, um, uh, together with the developmenting, uh, development, uh, with the developmental EGCs, um, which suggests that uh, most likely that there might be um, um, cell lineage uh, relationships between these, um, which was also demonstrated by previous work. And then when you get down to the, when you, when you, when you go to the juvenile, adult, and metamorphosis stages, uh, they're replaced by um, they, uh, mature neurons. And so we look at the cell dynamics of the axolotl-telencephalon during development, um, we see um, different, different modules, um, different gene modules associated with neural stemness and cell cycle uh, and also translation. And we see that um, the expressions of these modules are very high um, throughout the axolotl brain during, um, during larval stages, but, they, uh, but they, they're, they're mainly focused on um, in, in the uh, um, ventricular zone during the, uh, in, in the adult stages. And so next we investigated the axolotl brain during regeneration. So we made an incision to the dorsal pallium of the axolotl brain. Um, and we observed it's, um, um, the, it, 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 we observed across uh, six, six different time points, two days, five days, 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, 30 days, and 60 days post-injury. And we were able to identify 28 different cell types. Um, and more interestingly, we were able to observe that um, two cell types were distinctly, um, um, to, uh, were dis distinctly um, increased during these um, stages, during days two to, to 15 post-injury. Um, and these were, one was microglia cells, which are probably recruited for the inflammatory response, but the other is, um, the um, reactive, what we call reactive EGCs, because we realize that um, they, they actually have a d different um, tra um, transcriptional signature compared to the, the, the three different EGCs that we demonstrated earlier. And so for these, um, we, we also saw that um, for, um, so, so we looked at the ligand receptor um, um, Relationships. Uh, so, so, so uh, besides the um, besides the uh, reactive EGCs that appear, we also um, noticed that there was also a um, a uh, wound um, wound stimulated neurons called WSTs, which uh, which also express ATF3, which is um, something uh, which is a neural growth contributor. And so, because they're adjacent to each other, the reactive EGCs and the wound stimulated neurons. Um, and, and the, 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 the ligands and receptors that are um, expressed are able to um, ha have a relation. Wait, sorry, okay. I think I'm sure on time, right? So I gotta hurry up. <laughs> what? Yes, okay. All right, anyways, the, for, so, so for this particular paper, it's very exciting because we were able to demonstrate that um, that the process of regeneration and of development are very closely correlated, and that and, and that it mirrors the, um, the 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 development the, the regeneration process mirrors the development process. Okay, sorry. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good, good question. Yes, go ahead. Hey, very nice talk. Just one quick question. So how do you segment the, the cells? How do you segment the spots into cells? Okay, so because the, the resolution of the technology is at uh, 500 nanometers, so it's already subcellular resolution. So when you, we're able to get 850 spots um, at subcellular resolution. So combined with the image, we're able to get the, do, do watershed, um, we use the watershed algorithm to to segment the individual cells. I see, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, so thank you for your great talk. And then, then let's move on to the next speaker, thank you. Good. And then we are going to change the chair. Thank you to all the speakers for paying attention to the timekeeping because we do have a very packed and tight schedule. So uh, next in our lineup, it's um, my great pleasure to introduce to you um, an old colleague, uh, Dong Sung Lee, who is coming to you from the University of Seoul, and will be speaking about uh, the role of uh, epigenetics in 
single cell analysis. Yes. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Professor Christine Wells. Well, as she told you, she was my old colleague, so I guess this is the one of the things that you can join when you actually present at the conference. Meet old colleague and meet new people. Anyway, I'll start my talk. So, I'm Dong Seung Lee from University of Seoul. The title of today's talk is Simultaneous Profiling of 3D Genome Structure and DNA Methylation in Single Human Cells. So it's basically a new method that we have developed, which we named Single Nucleus Methyl 3C, and the abbreviation is SNM3C. Actually, all the contents are already in the title already. So it's a method you can profile 3D genome structure. Uh, there is a technique that can do that already, uh, named high C sequencing, and DNA methylation is for bisulfide sequencing. So we basically do the bisulfide sequencing and high C sequencing simultaneously at a single cell level. So to introduce myself, I use a lot of next generation sequencing, especially Lumina sequencer, and to profile epigenetics, which includes bisulfide sequencing for DNA methylation, chip sequencing for multiple histone modifications, and transcription factor binding sites, and et cetera. And also RNA sequencing to see the effects of those like epigenomic uh, modifications. And also used a lot of like high C sequencing to profile 3D genome organization. And this is actually the work that I and Christine did together back in 2014. We did DNA methylation and multiple histone modification to see the changes during iPS cell reprogramming from somatic cells. And then we also did a lot of high C on like cancer sam samples to see the chromatin conformation and detected structural variants. And the thing is, both of the projects were done on Burke cell, so we really couldn't tell how like, diverse the cell population within the samples that we sequenced. So we needed to deconvolute the data inside that heterogeneous population and we could what we could do after that is that we combine the data from the same cell types and profile and study the actual uh, what really happens inside those like populations so we developed this SNM3C single nucleus methyl 3C and the actual data are right there i'll show you the zoomed in version shortly we can profile chromatin conformation, DNA methylation, and also use the high c data to detect structural variation with it. And this is how the experiments were done. We actually do the 3C in Burke cell level. We do the cross-linking to, re uh, to restrict the movement of proteins and DNA inside the nucleus, do the digestion, and re-ligate them, hoping that the physically closed parts will ligate it together so we can see the actual interactions in it. And after that, we sort the cells into each well of the well plate and do the bisulfide treatment, mark them, mark each cell by unique identifiers, and do the sequencing. And also, because this method was never done before, even in the Burke cell level, we had to develop a new analytical method to align the reads from it. So we named it two-step alignment with unmapped reads using read splitting for methyl high C, and the abbreviation for that is Taurus MH, and the, the program is available in this link. I'll just keep the details of it. And this is how the data looks like. We could use three different features to cluster the cells in it, non-CPG methylation, CPG methylation, and chromatin conformation. And as you can see from this, we could cluster the cells into different cell types using all of the features that we used. But we could also see the difference in power of like how well the cells were clustered together and the thing is, we could only 
uh, classify the cell types by using the CPG methylation only because we didn't have the reference to use for, class for the classification in chromatin confirmation. So this is one thing that I would like to emphasize. And this is how the methylation data looks like in single cell level and also at a base resolution. Each row represents the represent single cell and each column represents the methylation status of each CPG. And you can actually see the difference in pattern of different cell types already at a base resolution in ba at a single cell level. Anyway, we clustered, we combined all of the data together to make the analysis simpler. And also for the chromatin confirmation, this is the single cell chromatin confirmation data looks like. And we also combined the data into each of the cell types. And the relationship between the interaction and methylation was pretty obvious. First thing we have done was we called differentially methylated regions and differentially interacting regions. And they were overlapped very well to each other. So basically means if the methylation changes, then the interaction changes too. And this is the heat map of the interactions. If the interaction is high, then the methylation is low. So we don't even have to do any kind of like statistical test to uh, show that. So it, it was pretty obvious. So these are the, here's the one example of that. So CEP2 is a gene that is known to be specific for excitatory cell, and inhibitory cell doesn't express that. As you can see from this, we could see the strong interaction between CEP2 and the long non-coding RNA upstream of it, and if the interaction happens, then we could see the low methylation at the interacting regions. Whereas if there's no, met no interaction, then we, could see, we couldn't see the low methylation. And also there was a opposite example, of course, ADARB2, which is the inhibitory cell-specific marker gene, ADARB2-specific interaction, and with the low methylation level around it. So to compare our method with the other single cell high C techniques, uh, this was the like comparison from the other data, other paper actually. So we could, even though the strength relies in the simultaneous profiling of methylation and chromatin confirmation, our method could use up to 60% of the reach they use sequence, whereas the others could only use around like 10% of the reach they use sequence. And we could also profile cells with the like highest number of contacts per cell. And this was the study done by other uh, groups. So what they have done was that they do the, the single cell high C sequencing, which was monoomic. They were, they were only could profile cell cycle not those cell types, only because they didn't have the methylation or like RNA to classify the cell types. Anyway, we have recently, we have done a performed SNM3C on brain tissues in different developmental stages from like 14 different individuals and classified the cell types with the methylation. And what we could see was that we did the same kind of analysis that the others has, have done. And what we could see is that this uh, global trend of interaction was representing the cell types, not the cell cycle. And also, we could find the uh, cell type specific interaction from the high risk loci of schizophrenia with RORB. So, we think this will be the new approach that we will take from the SNM3C. Please wrap up now. Thank you, Dong. All right. Yeah, that's all I have for today. And yeah, I'll skip the summary. I would like to acknowledge all the people who have taught me and like helped me with the project. And thank you. Kamsamida. I know this is very exciting technology and we have a lot of questions, but we don't have time. So I'm going to ask you to um, tackle Dong Sang. At the um, at the break, 
and join with me in thanking him again for a really fantastic talk. Right, thank you. So we are um, now with our next virtual presentation, uh, Lan Jiang. I'm really delighted to welcome Lan, um, who is a principal investigator at the Beijing Institute of Genomics and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Do we have him online? Thanks a lot for the Great. invitation. We to see a um, Lan Jiang from Beijing Institute of Genomics. I apologize for cannot attending the conference in person, but I'm glad I can still share with you our recent work virtually. Uh, the existing droplet-based single-cell transcript transcriptomics approaches are still costly and preclude large-scale study on millions of cells or thousands of samples. Uh, we notice that the droplet microfluidic system uses an ineffective way to minimize the doublet rate. In result, the vast majority of droplets are functional but cell-free. Uh, computational methods are is, uh, extremely helpful to identify and remove doublet but it can hardly help to increase the throughput and reduce the experimental cost. Uh, sample multiplexing can overcome throughput limitation by identification and removal of doublets and achieve experimental cost reducing and batch effect removing. However, those strategies only increase the cell throughput modestly as the data of doublets are not resolved and need to be discarded after being sequenced. Uh, Dicey, ataxic, sci-fi R-seq, and Cy2-seq have achieved ultra-high throughput analysis for chromatin accessibility, 3N gene expression, and surface protein uh, expression, respectively. Those strategies can substantially increase the cell throughput as the data of doublet will be resolved rather than discarded. Um, however, the droplet microfluidics based combinatory indexing 5 prime and single cell RSIC have has not been described. Uh, we developed a method called FIPRACY uh, uh, to fill this gap. The first round of barcoding is the plate-based pre-indexing of a whole transcriptome in C2 uh, through TIN5, index TIN5 uh, transcriptome uh, 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 using RNA cDNA hybrid as a substrate. And the second round is uh, Droplet-based uh, TSO barcoding in Tennis Genomics Platform. Uh, this work is currently under revision uh, and uh, genome biology, and you can find more details from this uh, preprint. As a proof concept, we perform fibrosy on a mixture of human and mouse cell line. We observe the remarkable low collision rate. Next, we confirm that the fibrosy is uh, robust across the cell or nuclei and scales well uh, using three-cell uh, three line mixture. Uh, we identify an uh, optimized condition for efficient uh, tagmentation on RNA-cDNA hybrid heteroduplexes within primarized cell or nuclei. Uh, next, uh, we found that uh, oligo, uh, uh, oligo DT primers uh, uh, with a uh, uh, whole cell perform uh, the best, and the typical sequence depth of uh, 50,000 fragments per cell will obtain uh, median genes of more than 2,000 genes per cell, which is comparable with the 10x genomics standard 5 prime end single cell R seq procedure. And random primers with nuclei seems uh, can detect more enhancer RNA. Uh, we op apply uh, fibrosy on 
on mouse E10.5 whole embryos, and we successfully recovered uh, more than uh, more than uh, 100,000 uh, transcriptome uh, uh, from nuclei uh, from a single 10x genomics channel, which is over tenfold compared to standard procedure in terms of uh, cell throughput. Also provides clustering, marker gene identification, and uh, comparison with uh, existing public data demonstrate the high quality and the complexity of our data. Uh, FAPRC enables investigating the landscape of, of uh, transcription star sites usage in a cell type and a single cell specific manner. We uncovered uh, a previously unrecognized TSS switch during gamergic neurogenesis of many critical factors. For example, at the early stage, this RB Fox2 mainly uses the most upstream promoter, while the downstream promoter, which skips the first two exons, get strongly activated at the intermediate and the late and the late stages. Uh, to further prove that our method can be used for large-scale single-cell arteries project by substantially increasing the sample throughput by multiplexing, we apply the fibrosy to human prim primary T cell from uh, uh, 40, 14 donors across five cancer types and healthy people. Uh, the T cell affects uh, enriched from frozen PBMC sample. We obtained more than uh, 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 40,000 uh, single cell transcriptome, which include uh, 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 the 12 major uh, subtypes. Uh, we will observe that the frequency of naive T cells in cancer donor are much lower than that of healthy individuals, and the frequency of T reg are sub substantially higher in most of cancer donors especially in a pancreatic cancer donor. We observed that the clone type shared by multiple T cell subtypes in one patient, uh, especially in stomach cancer uh, patient, uterine cancer patient, and also some uh, breast cancer uh, patient, which indicating the clonal expansion of T cell. For comparison, this pattern is not observed in healthy donor. The next, we leverage the fibrosis single cell data to explore the subpopulation differences of T Rex between cancer and healthy donor. Unsupervised clustering of T Rex from all donors reveal five clusters. Uh, surprisingly, T Rex from healthy donors are significantly enriched only in uh, cluster one. Uh, while cells from cancer donors seem evenly distributed across uh, all the cluster. We construct uh, a cancer index based on the ratio of cluster 1 and non-cluster 1 cells, and the result suggests that most cancer can be distinguished from healthy sample, although a small proportion of cancer sample uh, may lie in an intermediate zone. Okay, so in summary, uh, FIPRC uh, is uh, suitable for multi-sample and large-scale single-cell transcriptomics profiling. And it also enables us to acquire multiple layers of additional information from a single single-cell RC experiment with high efficiency, such as TSS usage, enhancer RA, and immune receptor repertories. Uh, currently, we are uh, uh, are actively involved in many projects uh, uh, by applying this uh, uh, new message to understand the adaptive Im immune system in different uh, disease. And I hope that the uh, knowledge may help us to develop the new drugs. Okay, thanks to talented uh, PhD students Li Yun and Huang Zhen and the funding. Uh, we also have a post position available uh, in the lab. Uh, okay, I would like to stop here and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, Lan Xian, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have time. One quick one. 
Okay, I had a really quick one, and that was just about the observation you made of um, transcriptional start site switching being very important in the patterning brain. And have you observed this for any other tissue? Uh, we just focus on the gabapentin uh, neurogenesis process, uh, but we have uh, identified a lot of other uh, template, uh, uh, transcription stars switching other organ, but we just didn't show the uh, result. Uh. Have you been able to compare that to the to the phantom transcriptional start site atlas? Um, uh, 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 it, it will be interesting to look at that. Uh, yeah. uh, no, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lan So we have um, one more speaker for this session before our plenary of um, Sarah comes along. And it's a really great pleasure to introduce to you um, Irene Papantheoro, who is coming to us from um, the EBI in... Um, in the UK. I, Irene is a personal hero of mine because she has done an amazing job not only um, working in a data portal environment to curate gene expression data, but she's actually gone to great lengths to make sure that this data is easily accessible and explorable for people who are not bioinformaticians. And I'm hoping Irene will be talking to us about the single cell expression atlas that is now available at the EBI. Irene, are you online? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be talking at the HCA Asian meeting. Um, I'm Irene Papathodoro, and I'm the gene expression team leader at Temple EBI. So today I'm going to talk about the single cell expression atlas, which is the main resource that my team at EBI develops. Uh, first, let me um, let you know of our mission. So our mission is to provide to the scientific community freely available information on the abundance and localization of protein and RNA across different species and different biological conditions. So basically, uh, what my team is trying is to, through our website and our resources, is for our users to be able to easily answer questions such as where is my favorite gene expressed and how its expression changes in a disease or in some other stress. Um, the way we do this overall is to uh, collect um, different data sets that are available in the public domain, such as in archives, such as ENA, GEO, Array Express, and so on, and also collect the necessary metadata for their reanalysis. We curate these data sets and we map their uh, metadata terms to appropriate ontologies so that they can be integratable and searchable. So then what we do is uh, we reanalyze this data from the raw files um, and for the single cell RNA-seq um, data sets especially, we standardize the analysis from mapping to quantification to normalization and clustering. And then what we do is uh, we integrate, uh, we combine these data sets into um, the resource expression atlas uh, so that the users can um, easily search for gene and protein expression across um, this knowledge and drive their new research questions. Um, so as I said, we have the expression atlas, which includes all kinds of bulk experiments, whether transcriptomic or proteomic and so on. Um, but here I would like to really focus on the single cell component of our resource, the single cell expression atlas, that includes uh, over 300 single cell datasets from 20 different species, and that comes to about 8.5 million uh, cells. So I would like to start by giving you an idea of what kind of queries you can do in the single cell expression atlas. So for example, um, you can do a gene query. Uh, here, as an example, we have queried a gene called NAPSA. And um, what you get is a result page with a list of experiments where this um, um, gene is expressed or is a marker gene uh, in some of them and so on. Uh, you can also constrain by species. So this one is in uh, for different species that are included or also constrained by organism part and or other cell types and so on. 
and filter your list. Um, then if we look closely, particularly in an HCA experiment such as the uh, Human Cell Atlas and open this up, what we see is um, a UMAP uh, plot from that experiment. On the left hand side, the cells are colored by um, cell, cell type annotation, whereas on the right hand side, they are colored by the expression of uh, the NAPSA gene. And what a user can easily see is that uh, um, this gene displays high expression in two different uh, classes, one of which is uh, annotated as um, uh, type 2 pneumonocytes. Um, another view that we provide within an experiment, such, the, such as the lung cell atlas, is a view of the uh, anatomy of uh, a lung, where a user can um, zoom into a particular uh, subpart of the tissue and uh, go into a highly zoomed region um, of the alveoli, for example, um, where they can actually see uh, the different uh, cell types and click on here the type 2 neurocyte um, and look at the marker genes, including NAPSA within this cell type and any others included in the, in the view. So now I want to briefly uh, talk to you through another type of query. So you can query by metadata, uh, such as a disease or a cell type. And uh, here in the main search, um, I put the, as an example, uh, a cell type called granulocyte. So then uh, what a user views is this kind of wheel uh, where the data is organized. So we see we have uh, data on granulocytes from uh, mouse and also human on the other side. And we can see the different uh, tissues uh, where this uh, cell type um, exists as well as other cell types within that tissue. And here what I simply did is uh, I clicked the granulocytes in blood and what appears is a heat map on the right hand side that shows that we have two different experiments um, where that include granulocytes from blood. And what we see is their top scoring genes. Uh, so um, in, in the first experiment and the second one, and we can see which genes are shared uh, or not. And what the user can do later uh, is click on each one of the experiments and look at the views in detail as the one I showed before in the lung cell atlas. So I would like to briefly talk about the analysis, how we analyze the data before we include them into the resource. Uh, so we uh, accept data sets from two, uh, the two main types of single cell RNA-seq, plate-based studies and droplet-based studies. And the primary part of the analysis is catered to what study they come from. And that includes um, filtering, quantification, um, and also aggregation of the samples into a matrix. Um, we use uh, Callisto and Alvin as uh, main tools uh, for those two different pipelines. And then we perform downstream analysis, uh, cell filtering, normalization, dimensionality reduction, and clustering, as well as marker detection using uh, the tools CAMPI. Um, we also have our pipelines available in Galaxy, and we maintain uh, together with the Galaxy community an instance for the human cell atlas. Um, for, uh, for any user to be able to analyze their own data or access human cell atlas data via Galaxy and perform their own uh, types of analysis. Uh, finally, um, I would like to uh, focus a little bit on the human component of the single cell expression atlas. As uh, what I said before, it's a, a pan-species uh, resource. Um, so what we are doing in collaboration with Sarah Teichmann and the Cellular Genomics Group at the Wellcome Sanger Institute is to develop um, a resource called the Cambridge Cell Atlas that is really currently the human component of the single cell expression atlas. Uh, so this resource is in the same spirit. So the data sets are selected, they're curated, annotated, um, 
reanalyzed using the same pipelines as the single cell expression atlas. And uh, the website currently provides the same uh, functionality. So overall, at the moment, we have studies, uh, from, um, 96 different human studies. Uh, about 51 um, have been uh, process, are processed studies from the human cell atlas, and they actually come from the data coordination platform of the consortium. And in future releases, we're going to continue adding these uh, integrated full body human studies as well. Uh, finally, I would like to give you an idea of what we wish to do in the future and some work that is actually in progress at the moment. Uh, so we're working with a clinical group, especially at the University of Edinburgh and computer scientists as well, who uh, develop uh, a pathology um, um, a workbench. Uh, that is really a tool to enable pathologists to view their images of the, of the sections or in the cells together with data from the human cell atlas and the single cell expression atlas so that they can observe in which cells a particular marker gene is highly expressed or not uh, when they uh, look and look at this alongside their images. Uh, also, in the future, we will uh, we would we aim to add uh, data from different modalities, especially uh, in collaboration with the upcoming Human Embryo Atlas web portal, where we can add this type of spatial experiments and uh, integrate um, existing frameworks such as the VTES web framework for the visualization and the query of uh, such experiments together with the uh, single cell RNA-seq data sets that we currently hold. Um, finally, I would like to thank uh, my team and uh, my group, uh, as well as uh, our collaborators from the HCA and beyond, and also our funders. So thank you very much, and I look forward to questions. Thank you for a great talk, Irene. And with there's time for one quick question. Irene, there's been a lot of talk at this meeting about um, human diversity and the importance of including data from particularly Asian populations as uh, it brings so much more information about um, the uh, clinical importance of these um, gene expression patterns. Does your resource have any capacity to host EQTL or polymorphism data, or is that something you'll be looking at in the future? Um, so the single cell expression atlas per se does not hold EQTL data, but uh, we are working with um, the EQTL catalog. Um, that is also a collaboration between EBI and the University of Tartu. And uh, we do share pipelines, so there is scope to um, bring those two together. Uh, so I know the EQTL catalog is catered for bulk data as well, but I think that would offer a good opportunity for adding single cell data in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time this, uh, this morning for you, this afternoon for us. Please welcome. Thank you. Uh, and please join uh, Yuki and I in thanking all of the speakers for this session. I'm now handing over to Varadum to, to chair our plenary for today.